Like car pawns in the game chapter for the downfall of Napoleon the international bankers planned the French Revolution so they could become the secret power behind the governments of Europe and further their long-range plans. With the outbreak of the revolution the Jacobins took over control. They were men who had been handpicked by the Illuminati and Grand Orient masonry. They used the Jude d'Orleans to serve their purpose right up to the time he was required to vote for the death of his cousin the king. The Jew believed he would be made the constitutional monarch, but the Jacobins had other instructions. Once he had voted for the death of the king, and assumed the blame, he left the real plotters free from suspicion. Then those who comprised the secret power behind the revolution ordered him liquidated also. They switched the full force of their propaganda, an LTM for me, against him. In an unbelievably short time, he was on his way to the guillotine. While riding over the cobblestones on the death cart he heard himself reviled, and execrated, by all classes of the people. Once Mirabeau realized what a terrible instrument of vengeance he had helped to bring into being, he repented. Wild and dissolute as he had been, he just couldn't stomach witnessing the terrible and shocking atrocities which the Jacobins were systematically perpetrating on all those who were fingered for outrage and death by their secret masters. Mirabeau was actually opposed to any violence being done to the king. His personal plan had been to reduce Louis XVI to a limited monarch, and then have himself appointed his chief advisor. When he realized that his masters were determined to kill the king he tried to arrange for Louis to escape from Paris so he could place himself under the protection of his loyal generals who still commanded his army. When his plans were betrayed to the Jacobins, Mirabeau was ordered liquidated also. In his case a public execution could not be arranged because his enemies did not consider they had time to frame charges against him and make them stick, so he was poisoned. His death was made to look like suicide. A book was written about the diamond necklace already referred to. In it is the significant remark Louis was not ignorant of the fact that Mirabeau had been poisoned. Danton and Robespierre were the two devil's incarnates who stepped up the reign of terror designed by the Illuminati to give them revenge upon their enemies, and to remove personages they considered obstacles in their path. Yet, when they had served their purpose, their two chief executioners were arrested and charged with their many infamies and then executed. J.T. Lafayette was a mason. He was a good man. He joined the revolutionary forces because he honestly believed revolutionary action was necessary to bring about much-needed reforms speedily. But Lafayette never thought for a moment he was leading the people of France from their old oppression into a new subjection. When he tried to save the king he was packed off to fight a war in Austria. Since the French Revolution of 1789, up to the revolutions going on today, the secret power behind them have used many Judy Orleans, Mirabeaus, and Lafayettes. Although the men have borne different names they have all been used as tools and played similar parts. They have been used to ferment the revolutions and, after having served their purpose, they have been liquidated by the very men they served. Their deaths are always so arranged that they die under a blanket of guilt which should rightfully have covered the shoulders of the men who still remain the secret power behind the scenes in international intrigue. Sir Walter Scott understood a great deal about how the secret power behind the French Revolution worked. Any person who reads his Life of Napoleon will sense that the author thought he detected the Jewish origin of the plots, 21 Sir Walter points out that the real key figures in the revolution were mostly foreigners. He observed that they used typically Jewish terms such as directors and elders, in their work. He points out that a man named Manuel was in some mysterious manner appointed procurer of the commune. Sir Walter states that this one man was responsible for the arrest and detention, in prisons all over France, of the victims of the prearranged massacres which took place in September 1792. During the massacres 8,000 victims were murdered in the prisons of Paris alone. Sir Walter also noted that the Communaut de Paris, the Paris County Council, became the Sanhedrin of the Jacobins who cried for blood and more blood. Scott relates that until they had served their purpose Robespierre, Danton, and Marat shared the high places in the synagogue of the Jacobins. 
My emphasis, it was Manuel who sparked the attack against King Louis and Marie Antoinette which finally led them to the guillotine. Manuel was well supported by a man named David who, as a leading member of the Committee of Public Security, tried Manuel's many victims. David's voice always called for blood and death. Sir Walter records that David used to preface his bloody work of the day with the professional phrase let us grind enough of the red. It was David who introduced the cult of the supreme being. The heathen ritual was Kabbalistic mummery which was substituted for every external sign of rational devotion. Scott also mentions that Chodolos de Laclos, thought to have been of Spanish origin, was manager of the Palais Royal which played such a devilish part in the preparations for the outbreak of the revolution. Another matter of importance is this, after Robespierre had been ordered liquidated two men named Rubel and Gohir were appointed directors of the Council of Elders. With three others they became the actual government of France for a time. The five men referred to were known as the Directoires. It is a very remarkable fact that Sir Walter Scott's Life of Napoleon, in nine volumes, which reveals so much of the real truth is practically unknown. Mention must be made of G. Renier's Life of Robespierre. He writes as if some of the secrets were known to him. He says, from April 27 to July 28, 1794, when Robespierre was defeated, the reign of terror was at its height. It was never a dictatorship of a single man, least of all Robespierre. Some twenty men shared in the power. Then again, on July 28 Robespierre made a long speech before the convention. A Philippic against ultra-terrorists. During which he uttered vague and general accusations. Robespierre is quoted to have said I dare not name them at this moment and in this place. I cannot bring myself entirely to tear asunder the veil that covers this profound mystery of iniquity. But I can affirm most positively that among the authors of this plot are the agents of that system of corruption and extravagance, the most powerful of all the means invented by the foreigners for the undoing of the Republic. I mean the impure apostles of atheism, and the immorality that is its base. Mr. Renier added, Flad he, Robespierre, not spoken these words he might still have triumphed. Robespierre had said too much. He was deliberately shot in the jaw to silence him effectively until he could be dragged to the guillotine the following day. Thus another mason, who knew too much, was disposed of. As the events which led up to the Russian and Spanish revolutions are reviewed, it will be shown that the hidden revolutionary section of the Illuminati within the Grand Orient Lodges of Continental Freemasonry was the instrument of the men who constituted the secret power behind the world revolutionary movement. Thousands of individuals are publicly blamed, and many organizations brought into disrepute, simply because it was within the power of the secret leaders of the WRM to saddle them with the blame for their crimes and thus conceal their own identity. There are not many people living today who know that Robespierre, Marat and Danton, were only the instruments used by the 13 directors of the Illuminati who plotted and directed the Great French Revolution. It was the men behind the scene who preconceived the pattern of the reign of terror as the means of gratifying their desire for revenge. Only during a reign of terror could they remove human obstacles from their path. Having run out of victims, the men who directed the French Revolution decided to engage in international intrigue again. For the purpose of increasing their economic and political power Ansel Meyer Rothschild trained his son Nathan Meyer for the special purpose of opening up a house of Rothschild in London, England. His intention was to consolidate, more strongly than ever, the connections between the men who controlled the Bank of England and those who controlled the banks of France, Germany and Holland. Nathan undertook this important task at the age of 21. He tripled his fortune. The bankers then decided to use Napoleon as the instrument of their will. They organized the Napoleonic Wars to topple several more of the crowned heads of Europe. After Napoleon swept over Europe he pronounced himself emperor in 1804. He appointed his brother Joseph, king of Naples. Louis, king of Holland, Jerome 
king of Westphalia. At the same time Nathan Rothschild arranged matters so that his four brothers became the kings of finance in Europe. They were the secret power behind the newly established thrones. The international moneylenders set up headquarters in Switzerland. It was agreed between them that, in their interests, and for their security, Switzerland should be kept neutral in all disputes. In their Swiss headquarters at Geneva they organized the different combines and cartels on an international scale. They arranged things so that no matter who fought who, or who won and who lost, the members of the international moneylenders pool made more and more money. This group of men soon obtained control of the munition plants, the shipbuilding industry, the mining industry, chemical plants, drug supply depots, steel mills, etc. The only fly in the ointment was the fact that Napoleon grew more and more egotistical until he finally had the temerity to denounce them publicly. Thus he also decided his own fate. It was not the weather, nor the cold, that turned his victorious invasion of Russia into one of the most tragic military defeats the world has ever known. The failure of munitions and supplies to reach his armies was due to the sabotaging of his lines of communications. The secret strategy used to defeat Napoleon, and force his abdication, has been accepted as essential for all revolutionary efforts since that date. It is very simple. The leaders of the revolutionary movement arranged to place their agents secretly in key positions in the departments of supply, communication, transport and intelligence, of the armed forces they planned to overthrow. By sabotaging supplies, intercepting orders, issuing contradictory messages, tying up or misrouting transports, and by counter-intelligence work, revolutionary leaders have discovered they can create utter chaos in the most efficient military organization on land, at sea, or in the air. Ten cells secretly placed in key positions are worth 10,000 men in the field. The methods used to bring Napoleon to ruin in the early part of the 19th century were used to bring about the defeat of the Russian armies in the war against Japan in 1904, and again. To cause mutiny in the Russian armies, in 1917, and mutiny in the German army and navy in 1918. Communist infiltration into key positions was the real reason the German generals asked for, and were granted, an armistice in November 1918. The same methods were used to destroy the effectiveness of the Spanish Army, Navy and Air Force in 1936. Exactly the same tactics were used to bring about the defeat of Hitler after his victorious advances into Russia in World War II. Thus history repeats itself, because the same powers used the same methods over and over again. But most important of all, it was the descendants of the men who brought about Napoleon's downfall who brought about the defeat of China's national forces in 1945 and onwards. Mysterious orders were given which caused millions upon millions of dollars worth of arms and ammunition to be dumped into the Indian Ocean when they should have gone to Chiang Kai-shek. The true story of the manner in which British and American politicians betrayed our anti-communist Chinese and Korean allies will prove that it was the agents of the international bankers, maneuvering to let communism obtain control of Asia, who deceived and ill-advised our top-level statesmen. Communism is today what it always has been since 1773, the instrument of destruction and the manual of action used by the international arch-conspirators to further their own secret plans by which, in the final analysis, they intend to obtain control of the wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. History records how Napoleon was forced to abdicate in Paris in 1814, then he was sent into exile on Saint Elba, he escaped and tried to make a comeback but he was playing against men who use loaded dice. Nathan Rothschild, and his international clique, had backed Germany to defeat Napoleon. They had planned to make money regardless of the outcome of the struggle. When the Battle of Waterloo was about to be fought Nathan Rothschild was in Paris. He had obtained, as his place of residence, a palace which overlooked that occupied by Louis XVIII. He could, when he wished, look right into the window of the palace occupied by the aspirant to the throne of France. 
He had arranged also to have agents on the field of battle dispatched to him by carrier pigeon information regarding the fighting. Nathan Rothschild also arranged to have false information sent to England by carrier pigeons regarding the results of the battle. Once he was sure Wellington had been victorious he had his agents inform the British public that Wellington had been defeated and that Napoleon was on the rampage again. The fact that carrier pigeons played such an important role in this conspiracy gave birth to the expression a little bird told me. If a person in England asks another where did you get that information, the person questioned will most likely say oh. A little bird told me, and let it go at that. Nathan Rothschild's little birds told lies of such magnitude, regarding the Battle of Waterloo, that the people of Britain went into a panic. The bottom dropped out of the stock market. English pounds could be bought, for a song or a shilling. Values of everything fell to an all-time low. Nathan chartered a small vessel for the sum of £2,000 to take him from France to England. Upon arrival he, and his financial associates, bought up all the stocks, bonds, shares, other properties, and securities they could get their hands on. When the truth regarding Wellington's victory became known, values returned to normal. The international moneylenders made astronomical fortunes. Why they were not assassinated by some of the people they ruined is beyond comprehension. As a token of their joy and gratitude for the marvellous feat of arms performed by Wellington and Bleicher, the Rothschilds loaned England £18 million and Prussia £5 million of this ill. Gotten gain, T.O. repair the damages of war. When Nathan Rothschild died in 1836, he had secured control of the Bank of England and the national debt which, after his big financial killing in 1815, reached £885 million. It is most unlikely that one Freemason in a thousand knows the true story of how the heads of the Grand Orient Illuminati infiltrated their agents into continental Freemasonry. Because the facts related are the truth, the Grand Masters of English Freemasons have warned their brother Masons that they must have no truck with Grand Orient Masons or affiliate with them in any way. The fact that the revolutionary Illuminati established itself within continental Freemasonry, caused Pope Pius IX to publicly denounce communism, and prohibit Catholics from becoming Masons. To convince any reader, who may still have doubts, regarding the part Freemasonry played in the French Revolution, part of a debate, which took place on the subject. In the French Chamber of Deputies in 1904, will be quoted. The Marquis of Rosambe, after some searching questions related to proving French Freemasonry was the author of the French Revolution said, we are then in complete agreement on the point that Freemasonry was the only author of the revolution, and the applause which I receive from the left, and to which I am. Little accustomed, proves gentlemen, that you acknowledge with me that it was Masonry which made the French Revolution. To this statement M. Jumel, a well-known Grand Orient Mason, replied, we do more than acknowledge it we proclaim it. 41. In 1923 at a big banquet attended by many men prominent in international affairs, some of whom were connected with the League of Nations organization, the President of the Grand Orient gave this toast. To the French Republic, daughter of French Freemasonry. To the Universal Republic of Tomorrow, daughter of Universal Masonry. 5 to prove that the Grand Orient Freemasons have controlled French politics from 1923 onwards a brief review of historical events will be given. The most important victory the international bankers gained, after their agents had acted as advisers to the political leaders who devised and finally ratified the infamous Treaty of Versailles, was to have M. Harriet elected to power in France in 1924. Every political policy dictated by the heads of Grand Orient Freemasonry in 1923 was put into effect by the Harriet government within a year. 1. In January 1923 the GOL, Grand Orient Lodges, decreed the suppression of the embassy to the Vatican. The French Parliament carried out this order October 24, 1924. 2. In 1923 the GOL demanded the triumph of the idea of laicity 
This is the primary principle essential to the establishment of the Grand Orient's ideology of an atheistic state. Harriet made his public ministerial declaration in favor of this policy June 17, 1924. 3. On January 31, 1923 the GOL demanded a full and complete amnesty for condemned persons and traitors. Several prominent communist leaders were to benefit, amongst them Marty who afterwards became notorious as the organizer of the international brigades which fought on the communist side in Spain 1936-39. The Chamber of Deputies voted for a general amnesty July 15, 1924 and thus turned loose on an unsuspecting society a number of international gangsters whose master was the Supreme Council of Grand Orient Masonry, the Illuminati. 4. In October 1922 the GOL had started a campaign to popularize the idea that diplomatic relations be opened with the Soviet government as established in Moscow. This movement didn't get very far until after the election of M. Harriet to power. This friendship with Russia campaign was started in France when the bulletin official de la Grande Loche de France published an article on the subject in the October issue of 1922 on page 286. Political relations were established with the communist revolutionary leaders by Harriet on October 28. 1924.6 J The same forces of evil are advocating the recognition of Red China today. One of the leaders of the Grand Orient at this time was Leon Bloom. He was being primed to become a political instrument ready to do the bidding of his leaders. High-ranking members of the military lodges in Spain who defected, after they found out they were being used as tools by leaders of the WRM, disclosed that every Grand Orient Mason was required to take an oath of unlimited obedience to the head of the Council of 33 and to recognize no human as above him. An oath of this kind taken by an avowed atheist literally means that he recognized the state as above everything else, and the head of the state as his god. A great deal of detail about Grand Orient intrigue in France and Spain from 1923 to 1939 is told in the Spanish arena written by William Foss and Cecil Garati and published by the Wright Book Club, London, England, in 1939. To establish continuity of the international banker's plot, it is sufficient to touch on just a few highlights. Leon Bloom was born in Paris in 1872 of Jewish parents. He was noted for the part he played in. The Dreyfus Affair. He was elected French Premier June 1936. He retained office until June 1937. He was re-elected in March, and remained until April 1937. His supporters managed to get him back into politics as Vice Premier June 1937 to January 1938. Mendes France is being used the same way today. During the whole of this time Leon Bloom's task was to mould French governmental policy so that it would aid the plans of the leaders of the WRM. In regard to Spain. In order to throw suspicion away from themselves the arch-conspirators made it appear that it was Franco, and his military associates, who were the planners and plotters of the events which led up to the civil war in Spain. It is now proved that Stalin, and his revolutionary experts the Comintern, were the conspirators who carried out the plans of the secret power behind the WRM. They planned to duplicate what they had achieved in both the French Revolution in 1789, and the Russian Revolution in 1917. As early as 1929 m. Gustav pointed out in his paper La Victoire the truth regarding Leon Blum and his associates. He had the courage to declare, the collectivist party of Leon Blum, the second branch of Freemasonry is not only anti-religious, but a party of class war, and of social revolution. Leon Bloom put into effect the plans of the leaders of the WRM to supply Spanish loyalists with arms, munitions, and finances. He was instrumental in keeping the Pyrenees open but he followed a one-sided policy of non-intervention. It only applied to the nationalists of Franco's forces. Evidence is produced, in the chapters dealing with the revolution in Spain, 
to prove that the French and Spanish Grand Orient lodges were the line of communications between the directors of the WRM and their agents in Moscow, Madrid and Vienna. JT, should the reader think too much importance is being placed on the influence Grand Orient masonry has on international affairs AG. Michel, author of La Dictature de la Francmagonnerie sur la France, gives evidence to prove that the Grand Orient of France decreed in 1924 to make the League of Nations an international tool for Freemasonry. The Dreyfus Affair. He was elected French Premier June 1936. He retained office until June 1937. He was re-elected in March, and remained until April 1937. His supporters managed to get him back into politics as Vice Premier June 1937 to January 1938. Mendes France is being used the same way today. During the whole of this time Leon Blum's task was to mould French governmental policy so that it would aid the plans of the leaders of the WRM. In regard to Spain. In order to throw suspicion away from themselves the arch-conspirators made it appear that it was Franco, and his military associates, who were the planners and plotters of the events which led up to the civil war in Spain. It is now proved that Stalin, and his revolutionary experts the Comintern, were the conspirators who carried out the plans of the secret power behind the WRM. They planned to duplicate what they had achieved in both the French Revolution in 1789, and the Russian Revolution in 1917. As early as 1929 m. Gustave pointed out in his paper La Victoire the truth regarding Leon Blum and his associates. He had the courage to declare, the collectivist party of Leon Blum, the second branch of Freemasonry is not only anti-religious, but a party of class war, and of social revolution. Leon Bloom put into effect the plans of the leaders of the WRM to supply Spanish loyalists with arms, munitions, and finances. He was instrumental in keeping the Pyrenees open but he followed a one-sided policy of non-intervention. It only applied to the nationalists of Franco's forces. Evidence is produced, in the chapters dealing with the revolution in Spain, to prove that the French and Spanish Grand Orient lodges were the line of communications between the directors of the WRM and their agents in Moscow, Madrid and Vienna. JT, should the reader think too much importance is being placed on the influence Grand Orient masonry has on international affairs AG. Michel, author of La Dictature de la Francmagonnerie sur la France, gives evidence to prove that the Grand Orient of France decreed in 1924 to make the League of Nations an international tool for Freemasonry. Trotsky wrote in his book Stalin, Today there is a Tower of Babel at the service of Stalin, and one of its principal centers is Geneva, that hotbed of intrigue. The importance of what Trotsky says lies in the fact that the accusations he made regarding the evil influence of Grand Orient Masons within the League of Nations applies equally to the bad influence they have in the United Nations today. The student who studies today's happenings in the United Nations will see their handiwork especially in regard to strange policies which just don't make sense to the average man in the street. But these strange policies become extremely clear if we study them to see how they will further the long-range plan of the WRM. To do this we only have to remember one or two important facts. First, that the Illuminati consider it necessary to destroy all existing forms of constitutional government, regardless of whether they be monarchy or republic. Second, that they intend to introduce a world dictatorship just as soon as they consider they are securely in position to usurp absolute control. M. J. Marques Riviere M. had this to say the center of the International Freemasons is at Geneva. The offices. 
of the International Masonic Association are at Geneva. This is the meeting place of delegates of nearly all the forms of masonry throughout the world. The interpretation of the League and the IMA is easy, apparent, and confessed. One can well understand the exclamation in 1924 by Brother Barcia, past Grand Master of the Spanish Grand Orient, at the convent of the Grand Orient when he returned from Geneva, I have assisted at the work of the commissions. I have heard Paul Boncourt, Duho, Lucher, de Juvenal. All the French had the same spirit. Beside me were representatives of American Freemasons, and they asked each other, are we in a secular assembly or a Masonic order? Brother Joseph Avenal is the Secretary General of the League. It is well to remember that the International Illuminati chose Geneva as their headquarters nearly a century before the above event was recorded. They had, in accordance with their policy, kept Switzerland a neutral nation in all international disputes because they had to have one place where they could meet and instruct their agents who were doing their bidding and carrying out their secret policies. The United States government refused to join the League of Nations. Certain interests promoted the isolationist policy. The secret powers were determined to exploit those who honestly support the idea of a one-world form of supergovernment to assure peace and prosperity. They determined to wreck the League of Nations and substitute the United Nations. World War II gave them this opportunity. In 1946 the remnants of the League of Nations were picked up and used in the quilted pattern of the United Nations which included the U.S.S.R.S. and the USA as the two most powerful members. The fact that the United Nations gave Israel to the political Zionists, which they had been after for half a century, and on the advice of these same men, turned over China, Northern Korea, Manchuria, Mongolia, the Dutch East Indies, and parts of Indochina, to communist leaders. Proves how successfully the secret powers laid, and carried out, their plans. It must be remembered that Lenin predicted that the forces of communism would, in all probability, sweep over the Western world from the East. People who study the Mercator's projection of the world, fail to understand how the nations of the Far East could sweep over the nations of the Western world like a tidal wave. To those who study global war, Lenin's statements are as clear as crystal. What is even more important, when Lenin had outlived his usefulness he died, or was removed. Few people can understand how it was that Stalin, by a few ruthless, murderous moves, removed all those who, by reason of their activities in the Russian Revolution, were considered better qualified for leadership in the U.S.S.R.S., and usurped power for himself. Those who study the WRM from the evidence presented in this book will understand why Stalin was chosen to follow Lenin. The old joint stock company principle was being put into effect again. American and British intelligence officers had exposed the part the international bankers had played in the Russian Revolution, to their governments. In April 1919 the British government had issued a white paper on this subject. It was quickly suppressed, but a certain amount of damage had been done. The international bankers had been accused of financing international jury to put their plans for an international dictatorship into effect. The International bankers had to find some means of countering these impressions and ideas. The true picture of their utter ruthlessness is seen when it is pointed out that Stalin, a Gentile, was chosen by the international moneylenders, and that, acting on their instructions, he put Trotsky out of the way and proceeded to liquidate hundreds of thousands of Russian Jews in the purges, which put him in power, following Lenin's death. This should prove to sincere, but misguided people, everywhere, that the international bankers, and their carefully selected agents and friends, don't consider the masses of the people of any race, color, or creed, as other than expendable pawns in the game. It is true that many Jews became communists and followers of Karl Marx. They worked and fought to bring into being Karl Marx's published theories for an international of Soviet socialist republics. But they, like many Gentiles, were deceived. By the time Stalin was firmly seated in Moscow as the head agent of the international bankers, 
it was difficult to find any members of the first and second internationals alive. The manner in which the arch-conspirators used Grand Orient Masons, and then had them liquidated as soon as they had served their purpose, is just another illustration of the ruthlessness of those whose only god is Satan. Further evidence will be produced to prove that the international bankers are not interested in anything else other than obtaining for their own small and very select group, ultimate undisputed control of the wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. 9. The only honest thought in any of their minds is that they obviously believe that they are so superior in mental ability to the rest of mankind that they are better able, than any other group of individuals, to manage the world's affairs. They are convinced that they can work out a plan of world government that is better than God's plan. For this reason they are determined to ultimately obliterate from the minds of all human beings all knowledge of God and of his commandments and substitute their own new order based on the theory that the state is supreme in all things and the head of the state is, therefore, God Almighty upon this earth. The attempted deification of Stalin is proof of this statement. Once people become convinced of this great truth they will realize that men of all races, colors, and creeds have been used, and are still being used, as pawns in the game. 1. It is of interest to note. Protocols of Zion No. 15 reads We execute Masons in such wise that none save the Brotherhood can ever have a suspicion of it and again in this way we shall proceed with those G.O.Y. Masons who get to know too much. Scudder, in his Life of Mirabeau says, he, Mirabeau, died at a moment when the revolution might still have been checked. Two my investigations prove that the men who have constituted the secret powers behind the scenes of international intrigue and directed the WRM. Today, i.e. 1954. Arrangements are being made quietly by the big money people to exploit these resources. Pawns in the game chapter 6 Monetary Manipulation When the Roth Channels of publicity are controlled. For this was quoted in the Convent du Grand Orient 1923, page 402. The Illuminati control masonry. 5. Henry de Lasse's passage quoted in La Conjuration Antiquitienne volume. I, page 146, requoted in the Spanish Arena, page 143. 6. A. G. Michel in La Dictature de la Francmagonnerie la France requoted in the Spanish Arena, p. 143. 7. All political events which have occurred in France from the outbreak of World War II to the recent refusal by Mendes France to agree to the EDC must be studied, with due regard to the long-range, plan, of the Illuminati whose agents, the Grand Orient Freemasons, are members of all levels of the French government, and all political parties. At the last check more than 100 members of the French Parliament were Grand Orient Masons. 8. J. Marques Rivière is the author of Comment La Francmagonnerie Fait One Revolution. 9. The reason the international bankers backed political Zionism from 1914 to date is explained in another chapter dealing with events which led to World War II. These geological reports were kept secret. In 1939 Cunningham Craig was recalled from Canada to make another survey in the Middle East. He died under mysterious circumstances immediately after he had completed his task. Today, i.e. 1954, arrangements are being made quietly by the big money people to exploit these resources.